Now, in Live on Live this Thursday, I'm joined in the studio by the Africa Reports managing editor, Nick Norbrook, for our monthly meeting on what's behind the stories coming from the African continent. Nick, as always, very happy to see you in the studio. Terrific to be here. It was going to be Marshall Van Valen who was going to fill in for you, but finally you were able to make it yourself. Absolutely. Wouldn't miss it for the world. Thank you very much. Well, and look, we're going to have a look at this week's, uh, this month's edition, should I say. And as we're coming to the end of 2017, uh, there's very much a look ahead at what 2018 might bring for countries in Africa. And that's specifically really in the frontline section of uh, this month's edition. Uh, this is the kind of thing that I love um, seeing in printed publications towards the end of the year. It's all of the nice graphics about what could be in the future looking into the crystal ball and in all fairness this month's edition of the Africa Report uh, does not uh, fail to deliver. Uh, starting off with the flashpoints to look ahead. There are eight in total but there is an overall synopsis that we start with uh, in the report about, about the AU and trying to really manage the crises that are on the continent failing in the CAR, failing, well they're pulling out of Somalia now but there are eight countries I'm not going to list them all, but in your opinion, which do you think of those eight is going to be the one to look at in the future in 2018? Well, uh, as you say, we, at this time of the year, opened the cupboard right at the very end of the office and, mm -hmm. and fetched the extremely dusty and often inaccurate crystal ball and, yeah. <laughs> and wheel it out and, you know, give it a bit of a, a bit of a rub and have a look inside. And, I mean, you know, goodness, it's, it's, uh, it's so hard to tell. But, but, but certainly, you know, the DRC will be a critical country next mm -hmm. year, how they manage this. Uh, next 12 months, you know, they've so kicked, the, kicked the election until 2019, two. but I would not be surprised if we see things starting to unravel before then. I think uh, Nigeria's, uh, you know, uh, the, well, the Sahel perhaps in general, maybe that encompasses a bunch of, of, of countries that are really worth looking at, but certainly Mali, certainly, um, you know, Chad, Nigeria's north, you know, the border with Cameroon, I think all that is going to be... Of course, well, hot. we have the Biafra, I mean, we have the Biafran issue that's really uh, to the fore as well as what's happening up north um, with Boko Haram. And, of course, we have the Niger Delta Avengers that have to be dealt with. And uh, you have a very interesting points to make on that, Nigeria. Um, where, since the mandate of Bahari began, let's say, two years ago, it's been, been a stop-start, really, uh, process because, of A, his illness, and, B, because him being a northerner, the old way of doing things with Niger Delta militants... Uh, it didn't really go forward the way they looked at it. So they put really kind of just a, a plaster on it. They've kind of put a Band-Aid on it to try and keep it down, but that hasn't actually have healed the wound. Well, what's really been noticeable, I guess, in the last 12 months in Nigeria, and is certainly the reason why it's come out of recession, um, is that they have managed to patch up things with various groups in the Delta to, to get the oil flowing again. And mm. so, they're, I mean, they're almost at their peak production levels now, which is considering where they were great for the country you know even if you might want to wish the country to diversify and grow other sectors of the economy mm. at least now there is some cash in the system and they can start paying civil servants etc but the, the thing about um buhari sort of presence or not presence weirdly when he wasn't there uh things were going a bit better it in the Delta. ticked along nicely with yeah well, the, the, the vice president has a relationship now with Osin some Banjo. of the government yeah Austin yeah. Badger the, yeah. the VP you know he went down to the Delta and from you know having spoken to a few Delta governors you know Delta region governors you know in the last few months they're all kind of impressed with him they you know he took them seriously he understood that what they wanted was you know uh, much greater economic investment and diversification away from oil and and really just you know paying attention to the infrastructure and you know as well as all the environmental challenges so he went down quite well in the Delta and that obviously trans translated into a, into a downtick in violence. Now Bahari's back in charge. We're actually seeing the, the violence back levels up again. creep up. Well, that's it. The divide is still there. But also, now let's kind of move um, away from West Africa. And of course, we have to look at East Africa. We have South Sudan, which is basically uh, the festering wound and the, you know, the, the newest nation on the planet. Um, uh, you have Somalia, where we have African Union troops that are pulling out. And you have the authorities, you have Formaggio himself that's saying, well, we're not ready yet. I mean, what's going to happen there? What vacuum, or who, who, should, what should I say? Who's going to fill the vacuum if the AU pulls out of Somalia, in your opinion? Can we see the Ethiopians coming back in? Well, I, I think that it would be, I mean, it would be great if any kind of, um, you know, well-organized security force 
came in, I think that vacuum will probably rather attract uh, ISIS fighters who are being flushed out of their very final strongholds in northern Iraq and along the Syrian border. They're all coming down. They're yeah. all they're, they're heading to to Libya, but a big chunk of them will be looking at you know um, Somalia. Just just uh, yesterday or the day before, Trump. Uh, authorized a you know drone strike which killed 100 Somalians just to say that you know that those kinds of things are, are starting to to really uh, the drone strike for example the drone strikes now over in the past three or four weeks they've been very regular specifically at weekends three four here there and always um, citing an unspecified number of militants have been killed so they really know who they're targeting here I mean that's the other question but I mean there's been these I mean it's just some very fantastic reporting I think it was in the New York Times magazine about the you know the the huge human cost of the the war in Iraq and all these so I mean, we we get this every time with with these targeted you know precision clinical strikes which only take out militants and no children on civilians um, and and the true cost civilian cost of the the U.S. presence in Iraq is suddenly coming out uh, I would be very surprised if the picture was any different in, in Somalia, sure. and I'm, I would suggest it, it probably is worse. And of course, looking into that dusty crystal ball uh, that has to be brought out of the back of uh, your um, newsroom every year, uh, we have to uh, mention the, the biggest story possibly uh, for Africa for this year, and that is, of course, Zimbabwe. Yes. Uh, I mean, these. this is a great time of change. Uh, this is, you know, the potential flashpoints. We have uh, the incoming president, Nangagwa, who is due to be inaugurated tomorrow. But what could happen? This is all so fresh. There are celebrations on the street, and I'm saying, well, this might be a little bit previous here. Mangagwa was, for 37 years, very much um, Robert Mugabe's right-hand man. You have it listed as a flashpoint. What do you think might happen now? Well, I, th I think the euphoria is very important because it communicates to the army and to Nangagwa that this isn't just a palace coup. I think this is the most important point. The, the amount of people who rallied last Saturday to shake hands with the army, but also to say, you know, we have been, you know, in the streets, all the, you know, the, you know this flag protests, you know, these, these very, very well-organized street protests that Zimbabwe has seen over the last 24 months. Uh, suggests that this isn't a palace coup and, and the army and security services would be making a mistake if they thought it was. You know, Egypt, there was a lot of optimism post-Arab Spring and we've seen the security services step back in almost seamlessly. LCC sure. has, has sort of re-established control. I don't think it will be the same in Zimbabwe. Mm. Now, that may, as a result, cause flashpoints because the, 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 the street and the opposition may say, well, listen, we are part of this process, whether you like it or not. And, you know, the more reactionary elements of the security services may want it just to be business as usual, but with their new guy at the top. Now, moving away from the flashpoints, I mean, there's a, it's a very, very, you know, concise uh, kind of ensemble of things that are in the magazine it's this very good crystal ball. I really, I really, I really enjoyed <laughs> it. But also, when you look ahead at elections, and of course, bringing back, there's, there were various elections going to be taking place in Africa next year. We have Egypt, Mali, the DRC, if it ever happens, probably 2019, South Sudan. How is that going to take place? The instability in the country is just not conducive to having any free and fair elections. Let I'm going to nominate you as an observer, Dave. Well, I would like to do that. I would definitely take that up. Would it be an Africa report observer, an AU reporter, an EU reporter, or just an RFI reporter, <laughs> I don't know, or observer? Um, but Zimbabwe, of course, is also going to be due to um, hold elections in July or August. Will they be able to go ahead, do you think? If It all depends on the next six months, does it? I, I think they would like to. Mm. It would make sense uh, to give legitimacy to Nangagwa. Yeah. I think he would like to, to go to the polls. I, I just, you know, it, it really now depends not so much on Nangagwa as on the opposition. You know, uh, Zimbabwe five years ago it would have been a different story, but uh, Morgan Changarai is not the force he was. He still has a lot of support. But he's still he's physically also ailing he as well. Is he's ailing, he's, exactly. Yeah. So yeah. if he were to stand down and allow a younger dynamic opposition leader to, to be the figurehead of a new uh, Zimbabwe, I think Nangagwa would have a, a serious run for his money. And any chance of a split within ZANU-PF over the next three months, the interim period, do you think? We're running out of time, but what well, do you think? Or is, it, is it still pretty cohesive, do you reckon? Uh, where, wherever there is patronage, uh, there, <laughs> there is <laughs> cohesion. And, and for now, Zimbabwe still, I mean, the, the ZANU-PF still very much controls that. They also control, you know, money going to the civil service, which is essentially where they get their votes. Um, 
so I, I guess that the, there might be a personality clash. It, it, a lot of really rides on whether Chiwenga, the army chief of staff, decides that, hey, he wants to hang up his car keys and go into politics. You know, if that happens, then I think ZANU PF could absolutely have see a lot of trouble. Yeah, some serious trouble. Well, it's a pleasure, as always, to have you on the program. Uh, Nick Norbrook, uh, Managing Director of the Africa Report magazine. Thank you very much for being on Paris Live PM today. Pleasure.